For your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment I wake up Oh, I will sing of the 
Hallelujah. Glory to God. All my life, you've been faithful, God. All my life, you've been so, so good. So I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Amen. If God been faithful to you on today, amen. God been so good to us, amen. The song says, all my life, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Amen. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. So I give honor to God who's head of my life. Give honor to our pastor, Pastor Samson, our first lady, deacon member, saints and friends. It's good to be here on today. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. One more time. The glory by God. Amen. Amen. Scripture on today will be found in Romans chapter number 14. We're going to read verse number 17. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. Amen. All my life, God. All my life. You've been faithful, God. All my life, God, you've been so good. Hallelujah. Ain't you, God? Can't do nothing but sing of his goodness. Hallelujah. God's been so good, y'all. Hallelujah. Now, verse 17 reads as following. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father. Lord God, as I come before you right now, God, to tell you thank you. I thank you, God, for you being God right by yourself, O Lord. Realizing, God, there is none like thee in all the earth. Oh, God, you are mighty, God. You are a great God. Lord God, I praise you right now, Lord God, for who you are, Lord God. I thank you right now, Father God, for you being the author and finish of our faith. I bless your name right now, God, for you being the giver and the sustainer of life. I glorify right now, Lord God, because you're our provider. I bless your name right now, Lord God, for you being my leaning pole. I bless your name right now, Lord God, for you being our strength. I thank you, God, for you being our joy and our peace. Ask you right now, Lord God, to have thine own way right now, God, in the name of Jesus. Ask you right now, Lord God, hide me behind the cross. They not, might not see Stephanie, God, but glorify your word on today, Lord God. Ask you right now, Lord God, help me to rightfully divide your word of truth, Lord God. God, that we can receive understanding, Lord God. There will be deliverance, oh God. There will be healing in the land, Lord God. Healing of our mind, body, and our soul, Lord God. Ask you right now, Lord God, to set the captives free, Lord God, by your word, Lord God. We bless your mighty name on today, Lord God. Have thine own way, Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. 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 The thought for today will be a part of the kingdom. Amen. A part of the kingdom. Amen. The Roman Empire, as we're reading the book of Rome, the Roman Empire was the most powerful empire in Christ's day. The empire generally was tolerate, tolerated of all religions. But the Christians, they refused to swear allegiance to the empire of all increased in persecution. The Christians were charged with being unsociable and odd and came to be hated and counted as enemies of society. They were simple and modest in dress, strictly moral in their conduct, and would not go to the games and the feasts that the other religions were having. The public came to dread the Christians. If the crops failed, if the rivers overflowed, if the plagues came, they cried out, Christians to the lions. They blamed the Christians for all these bad things that was happening. But yet the Christians, they were kind to all who were in trouble. And they stayed and nursed the sick during the plague when all others fled away. The Apostle Paul wrote the book of Romans from the Greek, the Greek city of Corinth. Paul wrote to the church that was experienced in a time of relatively peace, but a church that he felt needed a strong dose of basic gospel doctrine. Paul likely encountered a diverse array of people and practices from rough sailors, meticulous tradesmen, to wealthy idolaters and enslaved Christians. The prominent Greek city was also a hot spot for sexual immortality and idol worshipers. The letter to a Roman stand as the clearest and most systematic presentation of Christian doctrine in all the, all the scriptures. 
Paul began by discussing that which we mostly e easily observable in the world as sinful of humanity. God in his grace offers us justification by faith in his son Jesus. We are justified by God. We receive redemption or salvation because Christ's blood covers our sin. But Paul made it clear that the believer's pursuit of, of God doesn't stop with salvation. It continues as each of us you, uh, each of us is sanctified, made holy, as we persistently follow Jesus Christ. As Jesus' followers living directly under the shadow of seizure, he is appealing for help to bring the gospel to the western part of the empire. The primary theme running through Paul's letter to the Romans in, Revela in Revelation of God's righteousness is his plan of salvation. You'll find that in Romans 1, 16 through 17, which reads, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. What is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jews first and also to the Greeks? For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Amen. Paul showed how humans being lack, lack, lack God's God righteousness because of sin. He received God righteousness when God justified us by faith, found in the fourth through the fifth chapter. Demonstrate God's righteousness by being transformed from rebels to followers, found in the 6th through the 8th chapter. Conform his righteousness when God saved the Jews in the 9th through the 11th chapter. And apply his righteousness in pra practical ways throughout our lives, found in the 12th through the 16th chapter. The structure of Romans provides a hint into the importance of the book in our everyday life. Beginning with the 11 chapters of doctrine, the book then transitions into five chapters of practical instructions. This union between doctrine and life instructions for Christians, the absolute importance of both what we believe and how we live out our lives. Though, does your day-to-day -day life mirror the beliefs that you hold? Or do you find yourself in constant battle with hypocrisy? Take heed of the doctrines you find within the pages of the book of Romans. But don't forget to put into practice as well. Don't just read the word God, but put it into action. The first part of Romans, the 14th chapter, talks about Christian liberty, the weak and the strong. In verse 11, it tells us to accept those who are weak in their faith, the new converters, the ones that have just begun to understand who Jesus is and his work and his life and what it means to them. One person might believe it's all right to eat certain foods while the others think it's wrong. The scriptures tell us that not to despise dispute over such a thing. This is in the first part of the, of the chapter. We receive a young converters with diverse co convictions and questionable errors of someone that believes differently than you do about the matter. We are to receive them with tender hearts and not try to argue the matter or make them believe what we believe. Some people during that time were eating food that was offered to idols. Remember, not everyone in Rome were, were Jews. There were Gentiles as well, and they also worshiped other idols and other gods. Even some of the Jews didn't want to eat certain foods because back in the Old Testament, they were told that those certain foods were unclean. Regardless of that, Paul is teaching we should not dispute or argue about the matter. And then in verse 4, it tells us not to judge a person. We Christians do that a lot. We like to judge people based on what we think they ought to do or based on what we believe, what we come to understand. Feel we have the right, we feel that we have the right to judge. We feel like we know how certain Christians believe it's wrong to eat pork and others think it's all right. They start arguing with which is right and which is wrong. Why do we do that? Do we think that everything there is to know, we need to know everything there is to know about Bible and about God that we know it? Is that food so important that would stop God from accepting and loving that person? Are we showing love to our brothers or have we just lost a soul over a piece of meat? Yeah. Romans 14 and 4 says, who are you to them someone else servants? Their own master would judge whether they stand or fall and with the Lord's help they will stand and receive his approval. Then down in verse number 5 it starts talking about how some think that one day is greater than the other. Some worship on one day and others worship on another. I worship on Sunday, you worship on Saturday. Who is right and who is wrong? As long as you honor our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we're both right. 
Romans 14 and 6 and 8 says, those, are, those who worship the Lord on a special day do it in honor of him. Those who eat any kind of food do so in honor of the Lord. Since they give thanks to God before eating, those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this purpose, to be Lord both to the living and to the dead. So who are we to condemn one another, believers? Why do you think... Why do you look down on other believers? Remember, we will stand before the judgment seat of God, for the scripture says, As surely as I live, saith the Lord, every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that I am Lord. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another brother or believer to stumble and fall. I know that I'm convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ that no food in itself is wrong to eat but if someone believes it's wrong then for that person that person alone it is wrong and if another believe is distressed by what you eat you are not acting in love if you eat it so if I'm sitting in front of my sister and eating pork is wrong to her then I ought to set aside my pork so I won't lose that soul and not eat that pork in her presence if I know it's a condemnation for her but yet it doesn't condemn me but in order to win a soul I set that aside don't let your eating ruin someone of whom Christ died then you will not be cr cr criticized for doing something you believe is good as 20 and 35 says, I have, I have shewed you all things, how that so labor you ought to suffer the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. By showing love, you have gained a friend. Only the Lord has a right to judge, and he will judge the believers. Judgment must stop judgment must stop now because it spoils the harmony of the church by focusing attention on something that is a secondary importance to God. A stumbling block, that's mentioned in verse number 13, is, conduct, is a conduct that is offensive or causes shock to another. In case it brings an occasion to fall, it causes a believer to imitate the conduct of another with the result that the, that the field that he has sinned against God. If, that, if you are stumbling block for someone else, then you are making them feel like they have sinned against God. Sometimes in doing good, we are doing harm. We say we're only trying to help them by telling them and educating them. I say, I'm only just trying to tell you the truth, trying to help that sister. And the argument, confrontation, inquires, that's not winning a soul. You convert it in the word of God so they will understand. But in doing that, we may cause more harm. That's what verse 16 is speaking of. The stronger brother might destroy his testimony when he says to, to him, liberty comes from God, and the weaker brother says it comes from Satan. True liberty may be shown by refraining from the exercise of our own liberty. In other words, be quiet and allow the Spirit of God to teach and show them the right way to go. Which brings us to our lesson on today in verse number 17, which says, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, a part of the kingdom. Do you want to be part of the kingdom? The word kingdom means in the dictionary is a country, a state ruled by a king or queen. That's what the dictionary says. The basic meaning of the word kingdom in the Bible is. God's kingly rule, God's reign, God's action, God's lordship, God's sovereign governance. Since God's purpose for the world is to save the people for himself and renew the world for the people, his kingly rule implies a saving and redeeming activity on their behalf. In other words, he desires to redeem us back in relationship with him. That's what the kingdom of God is about. Do you want to be part of the kingdom? Broadly speaking, the kingdom of God is the rule of an eternal sovereign God over all the universe. The kingdom of God is a spiritual rule over the hearts and lives of those who willingly submit to God's authority. Those who willingly submit to God's authority are going to be part of the kingdom. Those who defy God's authority and refuse to submit to him are not part of the kingdom of God. In contrast, those who acknowledge the lordship of Christ and gladly surrender God's rule in their heart are part of the kingdom of God. In this sense, the kingdom of God is spirituality. Jesus said his kingdom was not for this world, so I ask you all, do you want to be part of the kingdom? 
How can I be part of the kingdom? Well, the kingdom of God is this. It's righteousness. Wow. Romans 14, 18 says, For he that is these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Romans 14 and 18 says, If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God and others will approve of you too. Righteousness is living and right standing with God. Now, what I think or feel or right may right be right to me, but right is right standing according to the word of God. Amen. You must repent of your sins and accept Jesus the Lord of your life. Righteousness is an action that by faith should come forth in our day-to-day -day lives. Righteousness is the way you live day by day. It's not something you do one time, but it's something you do day by day. Galatians 2 and 16 says, yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have no, we have not. We have believed in Christ Jesus, so we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law. For no one will ever be made right by obeying the law. The other part of the kingdom is this: peace. Not just righteousness, but you need peace in order to be a part of the kingdom. Romans 14, 9 through 22 says, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things where one may defy another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby that my brother may stumble, or is it offensive or make him weak. So then let us aim for harmony in church and try to build each other up. Don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable, but it is wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that might cause another believer to stumble. The ability to live in harmony with each other, that is the peace. And harmony with yourself, and harmony with your family, and harmony with the world all around you. You're not sitting in a bubble. Your peace is about you respecting and honoring other people. Be respectful of what they believe. Be respectful of what they think. Be respectful of what they're doing. Don't think that you're more hiding than you ought to. And realize and understand that it's God that working through you and in you, and God will have the last say. Allow God to do that, what God will have to do, and allow the peace to register re sure on everybody. To be able to deal with the things that bring you pain, and maybe through that, be able to bring peace to everyone else. Yeah. Proverbs 16 and 7 says, we people's li lives please the, when people's lives please the Lord, even their enemies are at peace with them. Will you please God, even your enemies are at peace with you. In regards to what you're going through, live peacefully among all men. Amen. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in the life of Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Because the word of God said, while you were yet in your sins, Christ yet died for you. It's not because of your goodness. It's not because of your righteousness, but because of Jesus Christ, you will be made right by God. So let your peace abide within you. Blessed are the peacemakers for what they shall be called the children of God. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. I give unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That's what you need to have if you want to be part of the kingdom. And like to become part of the kingdom, you should have joy. Not just any kind of joy, but it says joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy in the presence of Jesus. It was joy at Pentecost. And, when, and what was Pentecost? The coming of the Lord Jesus and the Holy Ghost to dwell with his disciples. While Jesus was with his disciples on earth, he could not get into their hearts in their right way. They loved him, but they could not take him in, their t in his teaching. They could not partake of his disposition, and they could not receive his very spirit into their being. But when he had ascended up into heaven, he came back in the form of the Holy Spirit, that he might dw dwell in the heart of all men. It is alone that we will help us to go. The ministry to his congregation with his difficulties. The businessman to his counter. The mother to a large family with care. The worker to a Bible class. It is with the Holy Ghost that you can overcome these things. It is only that will help you to feel that I can conquer. I can live in rest of God. Why? Because I have the Almighty Jesus with me each and every day. We know there is nothing so attractive as joy. There is nothing that can help a man to bear and endure so much
much as joy. We know that the Lord Jesus himself for the joy that set before him, he endured the cross. Therefore, is the joy of deliverance from sin. We are a joy that we have been free from sin. Amen. The Holy Ghost comes to sanctify us. Christ is our sanctification. And the Holy Ghost comes to communicate him to us, to work out all that is in us with Christ and to produce it in us. Let us remember that in the right sight of God, there was something more than work. There was Christ life, the likeness and the life of Christ in us. That is what God wants, that we will fit us for work. God asks not that Christ should live in us as separation, as a separate person, temple full of filthy, impure, foul creatures with Christ hidden away somewhere there. That is not the intention of God, but he wants Christ to form in us that we are one with Christ. And then in our thinking, in our feeling, in our living, in our imagination of his blessed son is manifested in our hearts and in our life. The Holy Ghost is given to sanctify us. That's the joy of the Holy Ghost. The joy of the Holy Ghost is the joy of the love of the saints. The Holy Ghost was not given to any man on the day of Pentecost, separate from others. He came and filled the whole company. We know how much division and separation and pride that has been among them. But on that day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost fell on everybody. It fell on every heart. And they will find it was as was said, Behold, how these men love one another. There was a love in the community of church and every head, every part of the church. They could not understand why was that so? Because the Holy Ghost was in the bond of union between Father and Son. And that bond is what? Is love. The Holy Spirit is just the love of God who come to dwell in the heart of mankind. When he dwells with me and my brother, we learn how to do what? We learn how to love one another. Though I be a loving, a lovable nature, and though I have very little grace, if the heart of my brother is full of the Holy Ghost, he loves me through it all. I might be unlovable, but if you got the Holy Ghost, you can still love them. They might hurt your feelings, but if you got the Holy Ghost, you can still forgive them. They might say or do something that heart cause your harm and might not like, but if you love them, you'll learn how to forgive them. That's the joy of the Holy Ghost. As long as man tries to love, it's not real love. But when love comes, the more position it meets and the more it triumphs. But the more it can be exercised itself, the perfect it becomes and the more it rejoices. Hitherto have I asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive that the joy may be full, that you want to be a part of the kingdom. It's not about what you should eat, drink, how you should dress. It's about righteousness, peace, joy of the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Come on, be a part of the kingdom. I don't know if you know it or not, but that's a song that I heard a long time ago. That song said, do you want to be a part of the kingdom? Do you want to be a part of the kingdom? They said righteousness, peace, Joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. He said, don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? He said, there's love in the kingdom. There's peace in the kingdom. There's joy in the kingdom. Not only that, but I am heir to the kingdom. So glad that I'm heir of the kingdom. So I am a part of the kingdom. Why don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? He didn't say he wasn't, that you wouldn't have any problems. He didn't say you wouldn't have any battles. But I know a man that defeated death, hell, and the grave. He didn't say it would be easy. But I know a man that said, Lo, I'll be with thee always. He didn't say that you wouldn't have any problems. But I know a man that says, Cast all your cares upon me because he cared for you. Do so you want to be a part of the kingdom? If you have not accepted Jesus, Lord of your life, you're not part of the kingdom. I don't know about you, but you're going to spend eternity somewhere. Where are you going to for eternity. I'm going to be a part of God's kingdom. There are two kingdoms. There's a heavenly kingdom and there's another kingdom. Which kingdom are you going to be a part of? I don't know about you, but righteousness, peace, and joy of the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Come on and be a part of God's kingdom. Because God is standing with hands open, arms open wide. He died over 42 years, came through 42 generations, just that we might be brought back in right relationship with him. He suffered the death of the cross. 
He willingly went. Well, what did God say? He died. While you were yet in the midst of your sins, he died for us. He gave his life. He didn't just die, but he suffered the death of the cross. While you were yet living your will, living your sinful life, doing what you did, God died for you. Why? Because he loved us just that much. But God still loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The who shall believe in him shall not perish, but have an everlasting life. If you want to be a part of the kingdom, it's just as simple as this. Give God your heart. Confess your sins to God. Accept there is Lord and Savior of your life. And invite him into your heart and be a part of that kingdom where you can have righteousness, peace, and joy of the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. How many of you want to be a part of God's kingdom on today? I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of that kingdom. There's so much turmoil in the world. We need that peace. There's so much hatred in the world. We need that joy. We need that love. We need that compassion. Stop this rooting against things that don't have anything to do with the spiritual life. Allow God to work a work in their life. The Holy Ghost will take those things down and be torn down. He'll fix them up and dress them where they need to be dressed. It's not your job to try to take off the little mini skirt. It's not your job to change how the man walk and how the man talk. That's the job of the Holy Ghost. Allow him to do it. Just live a life before them that God can use you to draw them to Christ. Don't stand in judgment. Don't stand in dispute. It's not worth it fighting over some meat. If you don't want to eat pork, that's all right. I got some chicken. I got some fish. We ain't got to eat pork. If you don't like my lump but don't like the dress, that's okay. I got a thing to put over my knees. You got to work it out. But don't allow that to stop God for working and working the other one's life that God can draw them closer to him. Don't be a stumbling block for anybody. Allow God to use you for his glory so you can allow others to be a part of this kingdom. God bless you.